Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Beverly Hills Bar Real Estate section for uh, today's uh, program where we will uh, hear about some of the important cases that have come down in 2018 and 2019 regarding real estate. My name is Howard Gould. I'm co-chair of the real estate section uh, this year and have also been co-chair uh, many years ago for uh, several years. And uh, we're putting on a full array of programs this year, despite uh, the COVID-19 situation. Next month, July 30th, we'll have Neil Kalin from the California Association of Realtors to talk about uh, changes in the CAR forms and possibly some other topics of current interest. Um, our speaker today, who's also been our speaker many times in the past, he also speaks for CEB on the same subject, and that's uh, Lawrence Jacobson. Uh, Larry is a lawyer of 52 years experience, offices in Beverly Hills. His practice comprises both real estate and business matters. On the business side, he does entity formation and restructuring, purchase and sale of businesses, and succession planning. On the real estate side, he handles purchases, sales, management, and refinance of commercial and residential real estate, and tax-free exchanges. He's also frequently an expert witness in civil trials throughout Southern California on uh, issues um, regarding interpretation of real estate documents, uh, real estate and mortgage brokers standard of care and legal malpractice related to real estate business, legal ethics and fee disputes. Uh, he's a past president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association and also formerly, I believe, a, a chair of this real estate section. He's a member of the Sales and Brokerage Steering Committee of the Real Estate Section for the California State Bar, served as a judge pro tem for both LA and Beverly Hills Municipal Court Systems, has acted as an arbitrator and an adjunct professor of law uh, in the area of real estate, secured transactions, and administrative law. He's written and lectured extensively on business, real estate, and ethics, and uh, including teaching for the USC Broker Development Program and the Graduate Realtors Institute of the California Association of Realtors. He's a contributing author to the CEB publication, California Real Estate Brokers Law and Litigation, uh, and a frequent lecturer for CEA, CEB, who awarded him their Spirit of CEB Award in 2011. Larry is a UCLA a graduate, both undergrad and law, uh, where he was senior editor of the UCLA Law Review and received the Order of the Coif. And Larry, thank you for doing this program again for us. All yours. Thank you, Howard. After a uh, year's absence, it's good to be back. Uh, our first case, Goodalock versus 6001 Association of Apartment Owners, deals with the question of dischargeability of homeowners assessments. In this case, the debtor filed for bankruptcy remained in her condominium unit after she filed for bankruptcy until she was foreclosed out. The homeowner's assessments that accrued prior to the date of bankruptcy were of course discharged. The issue was the dischargeability of the post-bankruptcy filing assessments. Uh, the homeowner's association argued that they didn't really mature until after the filing date. Uh, in response, and the one that the court uh, used in its analysis, is that the homeowner's assessments are contained in the CCNRs, uh, adopted many years before the, uh, uh, the date of the bankruptcy filing. They established that there was an ongoing right uh, or obligation to pay homeowner's assessments. The court noted that there were two ways that uh, the Homeowners Association could have proceeded to enforce its lien. An in rem action for closing on the, uh, uh, on the condominium unit or a separate civil action, uh, not foreclosing the unit, but seeking a monetary judgment against the, uh, against the debtor. The court noted that since The 
court noted that uh, although the obligation, although the timing of the payment was post-bankruptcy filing, uh, the obligation was entered into when she bought the property subject to the CC&Rs. Uh, so that uh, the post-filing uh, homeowner's assessments would be discharged even though they occurred after the date of the filing. Next, we have McNair versus Maxwell and Morgan. This is one of several cases we're going to be discussing today dealing with whether a creditor or a creditor's representative is considered a loan connector for purposes of both the federal and the state debt protection acts. This case involved the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act under federal law. In this case, there was a legal action brought by the homeowners association to collect undue assessments. Uh, the creditor challenged the court judgment, arguing that the law firm that was representing the homeowners association, which should be considered a debt collector, <coughs> and as such uh, was in violation. They failed to indicate the amount of the debt and they also sought attorney's fees. The Ninth Circuit uh, held that the law firm was in fact considered to be a debt collector because they did a judicial foreclosure. Uh, and as such, uh, they were subject to the uh, requirements of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Uh, as we discuss cases later, there's a major difference between a law firm which files a court action to recover versus a uh, law firm that is merely advising the uh, creditor on how to proceed with a non-judicial foreclosure. The key there is whether there's a court action or not. Here, there was a court action, and they held that they were that they accordingly fell within the definition of debt collector. Next case is Corral versus Select Portfolio Servicing. Uh, when you want to take a diversity case out of state court and transfer it to the federal court as opposed to an action that involves a federal statute, uh, you have to meet a $75,000 minimum. Uh, you can't transfer a case into federal court unless there's some significant damages at stake. This case discusses how you compute the $75,000 minimum. This was a foreclosure, started as a foreclosure case. The plaintiff sought a temporary injunction in state court to allow time for them to work out a loan modification. The lender sought to remove the case to federal court and the uh, debtor argued that they didn't meet the $75,000 minimum. The uh, lender said, well, the amount of the loan is well in excess of the 75,000. And the response was, this case isn't about recovering the entire loan. I'm merely asking for a temporary stay. And the damage impact to you as the lender of getting a temporary stay is far below $75,000. It's a minimum cost. And the court agreed with that argument. Said they didn't make the $75,000 minimum. Next, Phillips versus Gilman, another bankruptcy case. It's an interesting case. The debtor filed for a Chapter 7 and claimed a homeowner's exemption on a piece of property. The only problem was that the property was in escrow to be sold. And the question is, how can you claim a homeowner's exemption? You're selling the property. 
the court looked at it and said the issue here is not the ownership of the property, but the intention to stay in the property as your residence. And that's something that the lower court didn't look at. So they returned it to the lower court to decide whether or not the debtor was going to remain in the premises, which makes for an interesting question considering he's an escrow to sell it. Lee versus Field. In this case, the debtor, prior to uh, filing for bankruptcy, transferred property in order to avail himself of an exemption. The trustee filed an action as a fraudulent, uh, to set it aside as a fraudulent, tra a tra fraudulent transaction. The debtor thereafter argued that because the creditor had not challenged, or I should say the trustee had not challenged uh, the exemptions within the time period, that the exemptions would still be valid. The court said that although the trustee didn't specifically seek to set aside the exemption, he was seeking to set aside the entire transaction. And that should have been ample to give notice to the creditor, uh, to the debtor, that he was challenging the exemptions. Another case dealing with the definition of debt collector, uh, Davidson versus Ceteris. It involves whether mortgage lenders and mortgage services are debt collectors under California's Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. One of the problems with making this determination is that the act is silent as to whether mortgage lenders and mortgage servicers are debt collectors. And it's also silent as to whether mortgage lenders and mortgage services are not debt collectors. So the court had to look at the underlying intent of the statute. Because the vast majority of borrowers seek a mortgage for the purpose of purchasing a personal or family residence. The court felt that mortgage debt meets the requirement of being a debt obtained at primarily for fa personal, family, or household purposes. Thus, uh, a mortgage lender or mortgage servicer uh, would fall under the category of a debt collector under the Rosenthal Act. At a foreclosure sale, under a non-judicial foreclosure, uh, typically the, uh, the lender will bid in the amount of its loan, and, and it's fairly infrequent where there's an overbid by third parties. Uh, there are groups of real estate investors who will occasionally bid on a house in foreclosure if they think there's a large equity spread. U.S. versus Joyce looks at the conduct of those bidders, sometimes referred to humorously as the 40 thieves. And a group of real estate investors who participated in this, seeking to overbid the, on the foreclosure, realized they were all bidding against themselves. And that put them in a hole in terms of uh, the relationship with the lender who's foreclosing, who has most of the cards. Uh, they bid in the amount of the loan, whereas the outside bidder has to uh, put bid in cash. Uh, the outside bidder has no opportunity to see the inside of the house. Seldom, if ever, will get a preliminary title report. So they're really buying it blind. So these guys figured they were working at enough of a disadvantage so they were trying to reach an agreement to get a slight edge in the bidding process. So they agreed that they'd selectively pick out properties. And they'll say to uh, bidder A, you get this prop, you, you can bid for this property and no one's going to bid against you. And they'll say to uh, uh, bidder B, you'll get this other property and no one will bid against you. And that way, the price won't be driven up and the properties will be bought for the lowest possible price in excess of the loan. 
and then we'll all get together and have a separate private auction in which we'll decide who really is going to get the properties. For those of you out there who think the smells of antitrust, your senses are very good. Uh, they were charged with a violation of the Sherman Act for uh, a conspiracy in restraint of trade. Now, the issue was not, is this, a is this not an antitrust violation? Uh, the defendants agreed it was an antitrust violation. The question was whether this would be treated as a per se violation of the antitrust laws or would they be able to apply the rule of, e of reason? The difference between the two, in a per se violation, there's no excuse, period. Uh, you may have had the best of motives. You may even have had a pro-competitive effect. It doesn't matter. You violated the antitrust laws. Under rule of reason, you can introduce evidence showing that it has a positive effect. Here, there was a fair amount of things they could argue. For one, this system encouraged the maximum number of bidders involved in the contest. Second, it took away some of the competitive edge that the foreclosing lender will have. Uh, it makes up for the fact they don't get title reports. Uh, and they felt that overall, this enhanced competition. The court said, thank you, that's some wonderful arguments, but this is just an absolute violation of the antitrust laws. It's horizontal price fixing, and it is a per se violation, and we don't care what your reasons are or what your motives are. Uh, you're not allowed to introduce evidence uh, to, ju to justify the conduct. Integrated Lender Services versus County of Los Angeles. This is a case interpreting the effectiveness of a list pendants. In this case, some morally impaired person got charity grants from the county used for charitable purposes and the charitable purposes were put aside so she could line her own pocket with the money. Uh, legal action filed by the county to recover the money. They filed a list pendants giving notice of the lawsuit which were, was that they were seeking uh, criminal restitution. The lawsuit, however, did not seek uh, a lien against the property or to foreclose against the property. It was merely a notice of the action that they were trying to get the money back. Uh, several people, after the filing of the action and after the filing of the list pendants, obtained junior security interests in the property. And the question was whether the list pendants would allow the county to take priority over the other lenders or the other lenders. The court noticed the purpose of the list pendants. The list purpose of the list pendants is to give you notice of a pending action. This pending action didn't indicate anything that involved an interest in the property. They're trying to get a, a money judgment against the uh, the fraudster. So there was nothing in this action that would give them notice that there was an effect on the property. Once the court made its decision in the restitution action, that case was over. And that meant that the list pendants was no longer of any effect. It was merely giving notice of a lawsuit that didn't exist anymore. So therefore, this loss, this list pendants did not give them notice that there was an interest in the property that uh, could take precedence over their loans.
Next case is MTC Finance versus NationStar. This case deals with the situation where a lender made a first trustee mortgage loan and also made at the same time a HELOC, a home equity loan, secured by a second deed of trust. Due to a foul up at the county recorder's office, the HELOC, which should have been a second, was recorded first, making the first a second. The lender then sold the two loans, one to Bank of, Bank of New York, that was the HELOC, and the mortgage uh, to NationStar. The uh, debtor uh, defaulted, there was a foreclosure, uh, defaulted on the on the, on the uh, HELOC. There was a foreclosure by the HELOC, and not surprisingly, there was a fairly significant uh, fairly significant overage that was available to distribution, and the question was whether or not where it would go. Would it go to the homeowners association who had unpaid assessments or would it go to the bank? The court had to determine the reality of the filing. And because it was made by the same lender, that the obvious intent of the parties was that the mortgage, which ended up being recorded second, really was intended to be a first. And therefore, as the first, the foreclosure did not extinguish it. And the uh, and Nation Star, who had acquired it, uh, was entitled to the overage from the uh, sale of the property. Next case, we always seem to have at least one, sometimes more, of loan modification cases dealing with the duty of a lender uh, to the borrower. And the first of these cases we're going to talk about, the other ones will come later when we discuss 2019. This case is Rosetta versus City Mortgage. It is typical of these cases, there is a parade of horribles uh, requesting the same documents over and over again losing or mishandling documents, uh, denying applications for, in the words of the court, bogus reasons. Uh, the lender turned around and sued, excuse me, the creditor, the debtor sued the creditor, arguing in tort that the lender had a duty to the debtor and breached that duty. And the response of the lender is that the general rule is that a lender does not owe a duty to the borrower in the normal course. And the response from the borrower was to make an argument under Bianconja versus Irving, a 1958 case, California Supreme Court case, and argued under some circumstances, a lender would owe a duty to a borrower. And those circumstances are six factors set out in the Bianconja case. Uh, a close connection between the conduct and the injury, moral blameworthiness, policy of harm prevention. Uh, there is a split of authority in California in the courts of appeals, as is in the country as a whole as to whether this kind of analysis can be used or not. Some of the appellate divisions hold that Bianconja versus Irving is inapplicable, and some will allow you to make this analysis. This case allows you to make the analysis. And as we'll note later, a large, to a large degree, uh, it depends on which appellate district you're filing in California. Because Bianconja versus Irving has been 
has had significant new light in view of the loan modification. I thought it might be helpful, given the age of the case, uh, to briefly discuss what the issues were in that case uh, and how it came about. The Nkanja versus Irving, to those who want the site, is 49 Cal 2nd, 648. It's decided in 1958, which makes it older than even before I went to law school. In this case, the plaintiff's brother went to a notary who he'd used over the years for assistance in preparing a will. The notary said, of course I can prepare a will for you. I'm a notary. And he prepared the will. And the uh, now decedent signed it in front of him. And the notary, just to make sure it was legal, notarized it. After the brother died, after the, the decedent died, the brother, who was named as the sole heir under the will, sought legal advice. And the lawyer called the notary uh, to discuss uh, the effectiveness of the will. And according to the attorney, the defendant notary, in discussing how the will was witnessed, admonished me to the effect that I was a, lung, a young lawyer. I'd better go back and study my law books some more that anybody knew a will which bore a notorial seal was a valid will and didn't have to be witnessed by any witnesses. Any of you out there who do probate are probably rolling your eyes at this point, as did the court. The court said, no, the will is invalid. Uh, a notorial seal doesn't make it valid that the notary was not qualified to prepare the will. Can you see me or still hear me? Ah, good, okay. Call coming in on the other line. <laughs> um, and that in fact, they were in criminal violation of the law for, practice, for uh, the unlicensed practice of law. So the court said, in the absence of a duty, because the uh, brother was not the one who contracted with the notary, would the notary owe a duty to this person with whom he had no previous contact? And the court went on to hold that the notary did owe a duty discussing the factors which were that the transaction was intended to affect the, uh, the plaintiff, the foreseeability of harm to him, the degree of certainty that the plaintiff suffered injury, the closeness of the connection between the defendant's conduct and the injury suffered, the moral blame attached to the defendant's conduct and the policy of preventing future harm, which is the same standard which is now applied in the loan modification context. In, I have yet to see in any of these cases uh, involving loan modification an argument about the inapplicability of being conjured because of the new facts of the case. No one is suggesting that there is a criminal violation of the law by a lender by acting as a jerk in the loan modification process. Uh, that was actually the major factor looked at at the Court of Appeals when they held the defendant liable was the fact of the unauthorized practice of law. It was when it went up to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court expanded. So Bianconja is an interesting tool. Uh, it's getting a mixed review reception from courts of appeal but in any circumstance where you're having a problem establishing duty in a tort case uh Bianconja is there for you to argue and if you're in the right district you might be successful in your argument sms financial 23, 
Crystal's cornerstone title explores a not terribly well-known section of the Civil Code, 2941, at least not well-known to anyone who's not a title insurance lawyer. Uh, that section allows a title insurance company to reconvey a deed of trust without a reconveyance deed based on the fact that the loan was paid, that sufficient time passed, uh, and uh, after notice, the lender didn't object. In this case, the title company did all of that except send the notice. And the court said, you didn't comply with the statute. And the statute specifically provides that you're responsible for damages. You needed to set forth a notice, which gives the name of the beneficiary, the name of the trustor, the recording reference to the deed of trust, a recital of the obligation secured by the deed of trust has been paid in full, the date and amount of the payment. This gives the beneficiary an opportunity to object and say, no, I didn't get paid. If the beneficiary consents or doesn't respond within the appropriate time period, uh, then the, tr the trustee can record, the title company can record uh, the uh, reconveyance and issue its title policy without the uh, loan showing, which allows the uh, owner of the property to either sell his property or refinance the property. Failing to do so, the statute specifically provides for the damages caused. In this case, the lender hadn't been paid. And in this case, a year or two after the reconveyance, the lender said this loan is in default and sought to uh, foreclose which is when they found out that it no longer existed. That's how the case came about. Just as an aside, the statute of limitations for enforcement of a deed of trust is an interesting subject in and of itself. Uh, a promissory note that's older than 10 years creates a presumption it's invalid a mortgage becomes invalid, but a deed of trust goes on for 50 years uh, before it can be deemed invalid. So if you find yourself in a position where you're collecting a very, very old debt, you need to look to see whether it's secured by a deed of trust, in which case it still might be enforceable or not, in which case it's barred by the statute. Altani versus Knight. Uh, this is a leasing case involving a commercial tenant seeking to recover damages for a sewage backup. Uh, the tenant operating a medical clinic. After the termination of their two-year of their two written leases, the tenant stayed in the property, creating a month-to-month -month tenancy. Subsequently, the tenant stopped paying rent and the landlord uh, filed and prevailed in an unlawful detainer action and evicted the tenant. The tenant sued for damages caused by the sewage backup, saying, I'm a tenant and I'm allowed to recover for that because the landlord caused that damage. The Court of Appeals held that because he was in a, hold, a holdover tenant, and had defaulted, he ceased to be in lawful possession of the property. And therefore, he had no right to recovery from the landlord for damages he suffered while in unlawful possession of the property. Next case, Petrolink versus Lantel Enterprises uh, is a case dealing with a lease with an option to buy, which is exercised by the tenant. The option price was fair market value. The problem was that the landlord and the tenant 
couldn't agree on what the fair market value was. It took them two years and an arbitration to finally decide what the number was. During that two years, the tenant continued to pay rent. So once the price was determined, the tenant said, fine, I'm willing to pay that price, less the rent that I paid that I shouldn't have had to pay because I exercised my right to acquire the property. The court agreed and said that the effective date of the exercise of the option was the exercise date, not the date that the price was determined. So you're entitled to a credit for any rent paid by you after the exercise of the option. Then they drop the other shoe. Likewise, the landlord has had to wait two years for his money. So he's entitled to damages based on what the present value of the money was. You know, the difference between getting the money on the date the option was exercised and when he finally received it two years later. So they sent it back to the court to work out what the numbers were and what the offsets. Next case is a non-disclosure case. RSB Vineyards versus Orsi. The defendant had bought a piece of property, which was a vineyard, including the residence, which he converted into a wine testing room. The plaintiff bought the property and then found out that the wine tasting room was considered structurally unsound for commercial use and he was forced to demolish it. The buyer sued the seller, arguing non-disclosure. The problem that the seller had was that he couldn't show that the buyer had knowledge of anything being illegal. And unlike the real estate agent, uh, a seller doesn't have an obligation to do the careful, diligent inspection, only to disclose what he actually knows. The plaintiff said, you had this property uh, modified and converted. You hired a licensed contractor, a licensed architect, and these are professionals, and they knew or should have known, and they were your agents, and therefore their knowledge or their responsibility, their knowledge if they knew, or their negligence in not finding out if they didn't, is imputed to you as their principal. The court said no. These are independent contractors. They are not responsible to you to disclose to you or any obligation they might have would have been to the seller, not to you. And they didn't disclose it to the seller. In fact, they didn't even know about it. So therefore, you can't impute knowledge by those agents to the seller. Stats versus Vintner's Golf Club. Gentleman was out playing golf and he was attacked by a swarm of yellow jackets and uh, suffered pretty ser serious consequences of it. The golf course responded by saying, we have never had a problem with yellow jackets before. We had no knowledge of the existence. So how could we correct a problem that we didn't know we had? And the court noted the obligation as a property owner to maintain their property in a reasonably safe condition, which includes a duty to exercise reasonable care to protect patrons from yellow jackets. Uh, you know, they should have been inspecting their course for issues and problems and correcting them. Golf courses provide some curious factual indications. And the, the CAR standard disclosures, there's a golf course disclosure that if you buy property next to a golf course, there may be errant golf balls. I was involved in a case where they, that it was exactly the issue, and that was the defense claim that there's a disclosure. However, the issue at hand was not an occasional golf ball, but a continuous rain of golf balls 
that caused the homeowner to mow his lawn wearing one of these Michelin <laughs> suits and a, and a football helmet. There's a difference between an errant golf ball and a lot of golf balls. Okay. McClear versus McClear Gary versus Scott. This involved uh, establishing a prescriptive easement, uh, which necessitates showing the, the normal things that one uh, would. Uh, including payment of taxes. And the taxes were paid. They were paid just before the lawsuit was filed, covering several years in one lump sum. The court held that the lump sum payment towards several years of delinquent taxes did not constitute timely payment of taxes as required to extinguish an easement by adverse possession. Turning now to 2019. East West Bank versus Altadena Lincoln, Lincoln Crossing. Uh, because the list of cases uh, was, was prepared after the pandemic hit, and because of short staffing needs, I'm not sure it's complete. So for the 2019 cases, I will also give the citations. And this one is 2019 U.S. Excuse me, CV08738 JLS. Uh, this case looks at the issue of whether a penalty interest rate is an unenforceable penalty, or is a, or is sustainable as liquidated damages. Uh, for all of you that. Uh, do work in the commercial lending area, you know that almost all uh, commercial notes have a provision for a kick up in the uh, interest rate if there's a default. Uh, sometimes like a 5% kick up in interest. In this case, the uh, debtor argued that that was a forfeiture, that uh, It was too much. The court analyzed use of these kinds of provisions within the context of liquidated damages, forfeitures, and penalties. They noted this is a customary common procedure, and that in particular, in this case in particular, uh, the borrower had a lawyer. There were extensive negotiations and modifications of the documents. Uh, and that under all of the circumstances, this was an appropriate provision, it was not a penalty. Now, a couple of drafting hints. If you're representing a lender, for one, don't be greedy. Don't do a default rate that's like double the interest rate. Uh, make it consistent with, every, with what everyone else is doing. Do it with an eye toward the market. Make sure the loan itself is procedurally fair. Uh, and also ensure that the default rate operates separately from the late fee provision. Drafting tip if you're representing the borrower, as I do and as I'm sure most of you do. In your enforceability opinion, where you have all the exceptions, you probably should add this case as an exception to the enforceability, something to the effect that uh, the enforceability of the default interest rate is predicated on compliance with. Next case, it's a rent control case. Shun versus Del Cid. 34 Cal App 5th, 806, 2019 case. This case involves a single family residence built in 1908. Fast forward to the present era. It's now used as a boarding house. Each 
separate bedroom is occupied by a separate family or person. With common usage of the dining room and bathrooms and kitchen. The uh, landlord files an unlawful detainer action, wants to clear the house out. And their response is, you violated the Los Angeles Rent Stabilization Ordinance. And the response was, well, don't you know that single family residences are exempt from the rent control ordinance? This is a single family residence. Court looked at it, said, it may have started as a single family residence, but we're not looking for purposes of rent control as to what it was used for when it originally was built. We're looking for what it is being used for now. And now it's being used as a boarding house. It's no longer can be considered a single family residence and therefore it's not established, it's not subject to rent control. I am currently an expert witness in a case involving this exact issue, except this is a cause of action against the real estate agent. Because that was a specific question, was can it remain as a boarding house and is it exempt from rent control? Real estate agents said yes, and in fact, they called the county and they assured me that it was not subject to rent control. He obviously called and says, is a single family residence subject to rent control? And they said no. So needless to say, it wasn't subject. It was subject to rent control. Once again, a situation where a professional is rendering advice he shouldn't be rendering. Like uh, the notary in Bam Kanja, the real estate agent really wasn't qualified to give a legal analysis of what is or is not exempt from rent control. Next case is a uh, foreclosure case. Dr. Level versus Westlake Healthcare Center, 6 Cal 5th, 474. This is a case where the purchaser at a foreclosure sale becomes the new owner of the property and is seeking to get rid of the tenant and files a three-day notice to quit, followed by uh, proceeding to an unlawful detainer. The only problem was timing. He filed the three-day notice to quit before the trustee's deed had been recorded. Under foreclosure proceedings, it is customary for the trustee to hold off recording the foreclosure date for a sufficient time to make sure that the bidder's check cleared, then they record it. The question was, did the uh, foreclosing owner acquire title to the property when the foreclosure sale was conducted, or did he not have perfected title until he recorded the deed? Court held that there are three requirements the plaintiff must satisfy before serving a notice to quit. That the property has been sold under CC 2924, that the new owner took possession of the power of sale, contained in the deed of trust, executed by the holdover possessor, or in this case a lease, and that the new owner perfected title. Title is perfected by recording. Since the recording had not occurred prior to sending out the notice, it was an invalid notice, and the uh, landlord is going to have to start all over again. Part of the reason for that, that is it puts the defendant tenant in an awkward position because if he checks title, he's not going to find the plaintiff who is suing him. So he's left in an uncertain state as to who actually owns the property. And that's one of the reasons why. It needs to be recorded. We now get to another case involving fair debt collection. Obdusky versus McCarthy and Holthus, uh, which is 139 Supreme Court, 1029. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. In this case, a law firm was retained to carry out a non-judicial foreclosure. Remember what I said earlier, non-judicial versus judicial. And the debtor argued that he disputed the amount of the debt and that the law firm was a debt 
collector and was required to cease collection until it obtained verification of the debt and mailed it to the homeowner. The court noted that the law firm had instituted a non-judicial foreclosure and that the law firm was therefore not a debt collector. A business engaged only in non-judicial foreclosure proceedings is not a debt collector. Those of you who attended this program, I forgot whether it was two years ago or three years ago, uh, there was a case that said that a trustee doing a non-judicial foreclosure of property was not considered a debt collector. He was merely proceeding against the security, not especially since he wouldn't, with a non-judicial foreclosure, he would, there, they wouldn't be able to get a, a, a deficiency in any of that. So, once again, if the law firm is engaging in just the normal process of advising and handling the, uh, the non-judicial foreclosure, which in itself is kind of unusual, um, they're not considered a debt collector. However, if concurrent with that, they're sending demand letters to the uh, debtor as opposed to the normal notices uh, and threatening lawsuits and eviction and everything else, then they probably have crossed the line. So if you're a law firm and you're advising or engaging in a non-judicial foreclosure, stick to the non-judicial foreclosure. Don't go outside that. Black Sky Capital versus Cobb, 7 Cal 5th, 156, deals with a first and a second owned by the same lender where the first is foreclosed. And the question is, is the second considered a sold out junior since both the first and second are owned by the same lender? In this case, the court noted that the, the first trustee was issued and the second wasn't issued until two years later. What the court is looking at and what their concern is, something called loan splitting, where the lender says, I'm going to loan you a million dollars, 200,000 on the first, 800,000 on the second. I then foreclose on the first, and I seek a deficiency judgment for the 800,000. Yeah. This was not the case here. Different time. They clearly weren't connected. And the fact that it was the same owner doesn't preclude that owner from getting uh, from proceeding as an, un as an unsecured uh, junior creditor uh, because they felt that the, the, this was not a loan splitting situation. They were two separate obligations. We also had a case, it was also I think two, two years ago, involving a first and a second simultaneously given by the same lender. And then loan A was assigned to trust or uh, to uh, beneficiary X and loan B was transferred to beneficiary Y. So you had two different beneficiaries for a closing on a simultaneously recorded first and second. That the court noted that it wasn't a foreclosure by the original lender. It was separate lenders, each of whom now have separate uh, interests. Sheen versus Wells Fargo Bank, 38 Cal at 5th, 346. This is uh, another one of the Bianconja versus Irving. Is there a duty? Homeowner was suing uh, for, uh, for damages resulting from an improper foreclosure. And the court said, there was no personal injury alleged, no property damages alleged, so therefore there's no tort duty to the borrower. And they argued being conja, and this was a district in which the court said uh, that they would not apply being conja because there was a split of authority in California, and at least 23 state courts have followed the general rule of refusing to impose loan modifications 
under the view then will be unconscionable. And uh, we are just a couple minutes before the end of the hour. So thank you, Larry, for getting through all those cases and compiling all that for us. Um, uh, Howard, let me do something that I don't normally do, given right. the uniqueness of the situation. My office telephone number is 310-271-0747. So if any of the uh, attendees have a question, feel free to give me a call. I'm doing that because I want to accommodate the attendees and also because of the pandemic, I'm lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we are in a different world. There was a, someone asked a question. The last case on your list was Eisen versus Tavangar, or Tavangarian, I think. And uh, that case you did, didn't cover? We didn't have time to cover them all, so I was disposing of cases in reverse order of importance. Okay. Um, all right, well, we will... Uh, leave that, um, uh, Gail, thank you for the question, but um, I think we'll leave that site for you to go look up. Uh, thank you, Larry, again. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we thank the Beverly Hills Bar staff for assisting with the Zoom presentation, and look forward to having uh, all of you attend, hopefully, next month when Neil Kalin talks about the CAR firms. Thank you again. <laughs>